would not have been necessary if the, the German population had agreed to the austerity measures that the international bankers wanted. And that was like, that was the last debate that LaRouge ever had with any leading person, uh, anybody, after that. But what Abu Murray was saying is that if you can get the people to accept these, these austerity policies on behalf of the financial system that they know, then, it, then, the, then the fascist measures are not required. Now, uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to go through a, uh, a document that's on our website, which is two parts of it are now up, and there will be a third part of it. And it's written by our legal expert. Her name is Barbara Boy. And what, what she has done is she has integrated the document that was put out recently by the House of Lords and called United Kingdom Foreign Policy in a Shifting World Order with the anonymous um, dumping of massive records uh, four, uh, four, uh, four times from November, uh, from the end of November to January 4th. And what those documents, which reveal things like the uh, Integrity Initiative, the Institute for Statecraft, and so forth and so on. And what, what you put, if you put these two things together and you connect it up also to the, um, to the, to the, uh, who is being run against Donald Trump, everything becomes relatively crystal clear. Even though you don't have all, all the, the whole deep state, everything becomes relatively crystal clear. And uh, such, that you, such that if you understand what this is, and the evidence is there, you understand where the coordinating agency for all of this is coming from, and also you understand that Obama and Hillary Clinton and Robert Mueller, they are part, part of the situation, but they do not, they're not the controlling factor. They're not the determining factor in the situation. So I'll start with the Lord, uh, the Lord's report, or the House of Lords report. It's entitled, The United Kingdom Foreign Policy in a Shifting World Order. So they're saying that the world order is shifting. Damn straight it is. Now, Trump, the, the two, there's two key features in this report that are threatening what they call the post-war rules-based international order and the special relationship, the special relationship that they have with the United States, which developed coming out of World War II. And they say that the two things are threatening. One is that Trump has imperiled the post-war rules-based international order and the special. So they're saying Trump is imperiling or threatening that relationship. And they are very open in this report. Now the report is written in diplomatese, and I'll get into that in a second. They're very open about uh, the success they've had since the end of World War II in infiltrating and controlling the U.S. following, uh, you know, beginning with the Cold War. And what they say is that their covert defense and intelligence relationship currently is sufficient to survive one term of Donald Trump, but not two. That's a, that, what they're saying is that this covert relationship through the five eyes and everything else, that's been developed since the Cold War, since the beginning of the Cold War, is so massive that it can survive Donald Trump. It's one term. That's what they're saying. Uh, and hold on, I got my wrong, I got the wrong notes here. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I apologize. Uh, I'm gonna start over. I'm sorry. I apologize. I had the wrong notes. Tonight I want to present some of Barbara Boy's article, which. Part one and part two are up, and part three 
uh, the British role in the coup against the presidency is now exposed. Uh, and it's called will, it's called the British role in the coup against the U.S. presidency is now exposed. Will you now act to save the nation? So what Barbara Boyd has done is take the Lord's report, UK foreign policy and shifting the world, and from that context examine the four huge dumps that I just explained. I encourage everyone to study in its entirety this report. I personally believe that this report, if properly disseminated, will dramatically advance the understanding for everyone of the British role, not only in the coup against Donald Trump, but in a global military information hybrid warfare that's being run against against everyone in the world, against the coming new paradigm of, nation, of, of na national development, and against the Belt and Road, and against the, uh, the development of every country on the planet. What Barbara Boyd demonstrates is the total coherence between the Lord's Report, the recommendations for imperial renewal in a shifting world, and the operational structure for implementing this survival. The Lord's Report for a Shifting World Order before I go into what the report says and recommends, I want to put it in a historical perspective. The House of Lords is not the elected part of the British Parliament. This is the, uh, this is the, this is the part of the Parliament appointed by the Crown. They represent historically the interests of the Crown, the oligarchy or British landed aristocracy, and the Empire as a whole. When a crisis hits the empire, these lords are tasked with investigating uh, and finding out the problems confronting the empire and recommending solutions. While the recommendation may already be in progress, this is the definitive explanation of the direction the empire is recommended to go in from the House of Lords. The report is couched in a certain language such that uh, uh, we call it diplomatese, the import of what is being said and recommended would only be understood by those already understanding or, or have a sense of how things work. It is my belief that the, the ability uh, to connect the intentions of the report on the ground, to the on-the-ground activity which has been revealed by, by us and others earlier and subsequently in the four anonymous dumps represent a fundamental breakthrough in putting stated intention and application coherently together, this could have enormous implications for defeating the empire and, and enormous implications for, for the future of humanity. So what is in the report? The report centers on two main threats to the empire, the, the election of Donald Trump and the economic transformation of China in the Belt and Road. First, Trump has imperiled the post-war rules-based international order as well as a special relationship. And the Lord's report in their diplomatese is open about Britain's infiltration and control of the U.S. after World War II. That their covert and intelligence relations within the U.S. are sufficient to survive one term of Donald Trump. In this respect, the, uh, the blame for Brexit and the Trump election is not on the deteriorating economic conditions of life, the deteriorating conditions of life of the population, but rather the freedom of individual access uh, to the world of inf uh, instantaneous world of information and that censorship and propaganda regimes are needed to be installed to end this freedom. So what they're claiming is that it's not the conditions of life that have caused the revolt. It's the availability of information that free people can uh, obtain and that needs to be shut down, that needs to be censored and so forth and so on. So what is the post-World War II rules-based order? So this is what, what uh, they're talking about. Basically, it is the preservation and continuation of the colonial system through other means after World War II. FDR had intended, Fred Donald had intended to, to use the, 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 uh, uh, the Bretton Woods system and the, uh, and the uh, International Monetary Fund to actually end the colonial system. But they were able to transform those institutions into a, a more modern form of imperialism and debt, debt slavery. The second, the threat, of, the threat of China. The Lord's report proposes that there be an all-out infiltration into the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the Belt and Road to bend it towards imperial interests. That they need to get inside the, the whole process of which China is, is running to subvert it. 
and that India is very, very important, that India needs to be targeted so to become much closer to the British and in and, and every way foster India-China uh, 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 division and, 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 and opposition. And that the old rules-based order be maintained for Europe, mainly Russia out, Germany down, and, and, and the role of NATO in this respect. But in order to make it work, you have to have the U.S. Uh, be the enforcer. And that's, that's the problem. So, so if they can, if they can, their view is that they can get, if they can prevent a second administration of Donald Trump, uh, then they will have a, the ability to use the U.S. to keep, to keep, to keep Europe in check, to keep Russia out. At one point, the report describes the special relationship as an iceberg, where you only see the top, which has so far, uh, and and which, which, which iceberg has so far been able to contain, box in, prevent the execution of the declared agenda of Donald Trump. So in other words, they have succeeded as far as they're concerned up until now in being able to actually block Trump from doing what, he, what, he, what he, his intentions were. Uh, and again, the things that Trump has done that, that, uh, that indicate his intention our rejection of the climate treaty, uh, the uh, compact immigration treaty, the human rights, the uh, uh, treaty with Iran, uh, the trade war with China is no, no, is not part of their, their their program. And but he has not he has not been able to 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 move, and of course uh, pulling the troops out of out of, out of out of out of these wars and all of that. He's been he's been very much blocked. So it's the extreme importance of all this is that the coup is not coming from those who are defending. The coup is not coming from those who mo who are defending Trump believe. In other words, the people who believe who are defending Trump do not really fully understand where the coup is coming from. And and our mission is to make sure that they do, because if that happens, then we're and the, the coup can be defeated. If you don't if you don't know where it's coming from. You can't really fully defeat the coup because everything's popping up all over the place. <coughs> and and then we can tear this thing apart and accelerate the end of the special relationship and free the U.S. And by freeing the U.S., we also free Europe. And we create the basis for a new um, global architecture, uh, a new uh, um, financial financial system and, and, and a different world. Now, so now we go to the integrity initiative. Now, what what that uh, exposes, what the what the anonymous dumps is so very important, is that it exposes a rapid response black propaganda information warfare operation targeting Russia, China, Western Europe, the U.S. has been in full swing. It is based on a British non-governmental organization, which is 95% uh, financed by the British government. That's the Institute for Statescraft. 95% uh, financed by the British government, NATO, and the U.S. State Department. Its headquarters is where the home of the Lord Astor was once, and where the Institute for Strategic Studies, the center of British foreign policy is. It operates on the basis of clusters combining journalists, military, foreign office personnel, embassies, consulates, academias, ac academics, lobbyists, within every European country, United States, Canada, and looking now to expand into the Middle East, and also into the middle of the United States, uh, because they're going to try to, to go after uh, Trump's voter base. The U.S. cluster, which he goes into, involves people such as Evelyn Farkas, and Applebaum of the Washington Post, Bill Browder of the, the Magnitsky fame, Ed Lucas, the Center for European Policy Analysis, and the, the uh, Institute for uh, Statescraft is led by Christopher Donnelly, a long-term British military intelligence officer. And uh, he was supposed to attend a, a meeting in Seattle. He couldn't. 
Simon Bracey Lane, our representative, he, he was the guy who infiltrated the Bernie Sanders campaign and read remarks from Donnelly in Seattle to the effect that the West was no, the West was no longer in a peacetime rules-based environment. The conclusion is that we have uh, to look for people who suit a wartime environment and that they need to recruit, um, especially from the alt-right, uh, uh, they, they, they have some kind of relationship with Steve Bannon and, 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 and the guy Gorka who got kicked out. And so they, so they, they, they want to recruit uh, from those layers. Now, connecting networks, uh, you have the, the big one is the Atlantic Council, funded by the British government and NATO, and U.S. Uh, is, uh, US uh, key U.S. Um, foundations, and, and it includes an, an analyst from the Financial Analysis and Resilience Center, which represents the eight, which represents eight, the eight largest banks and the U.S. military cyber command. So what it is is the banks have an entity which works with U.S. cyber command uh, to deal with the financial system. Okay, so you have the U.S. military, Cyber Command, involved in trying to keep the financial system from blowing up. And this is where you have the integration of the major banks with the military. It's not just in terms of deployment of troops, but it's deployment of cyber operations to, to deal with the financial crisis. The key, a key person in all of this is former MI6 director, uh, Sir Richard Dearlaw, who is the mentor of Christopher Steele. And he is now at the Henry Jackson Society. And in this context, he is saying, he's telling everybody that Donald Trump will be a one-term president. Okay. Then you have the other, agent, other entity called the Hudson Institute. And this guy, Michael P Pillsbury, and it's primarily uh, being deployed to destroy U.S.-China relations. And it's all connected up. Then you have something called the British 77th Brigade which is an in, in, information and warfare initiative. Basically, these people, the entire brigade is sitting at a computer, are hacking away and, and, and trolling away and so forth and so on, on websites all over the world. Uh, 200 websites in the U.S. have been uh, accused of being influenced by Russian intelligence. Uh, and one of these the, the, was being financed by the State Department is the Global Engagement Center, which Trump def uh, uh, stopped the funding of, but uh, Secretary of State Pompeo has put the money back in. And it is connected to something called Global Database on Events, Language, and Tone. And what it does is they can, they can do uh, uh, a lot, um, what do they call it, uh, algorithms, to sense the tone of the population, to sense the tone and so forth and so on, where you have the most anti-Russia, where you have the most pro-Russia, and so on and so forth. To, so they can, they can streamline their, their targeting. Sputnik, RT, and everything else uh, that is not uh, doing the narrative, or that people might, uh, might, step, might, might stumble upon and, 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 and use to uh, think about all these things, uh, are, are, are targeted. And the big place is Germany, because the German population does not buy the idea in general that, that Russia is the enemy. They live next to Russia. They have been invaded by Russia. Many Germans speak Russian. They know that what Russia is. They're close. They're not like, you know, in, in somewhere in Georgia, in Mississippi, in Alabama. They're living right there. They, they, know, they, they, have, a, they have a lot more interchange with Russia. They know Russia's not the enemy. So anyone, so this is, these are, all, there's 21 of these things that, that most Germans think. One is that the Nazis <laughs> ran the uh, coup, that Russia's not the problem, that Crimea, this, Russia has a legitimate right to Crimea, and so on and so forth, which they're now targeting to change. This is an example. Uh, now, then there's the whole, issue of censorship and cognitive infiltration. 
Uh, the idea of censorship, you understand, the idea of cognitive infiltration is developed during the Obama administration by someone by the name of Cass Sunstein, who was the husband of Samantha Powers, who I believe for a while was the UN um, Secretary General, I mean UN uh, Ambassador for the US. Now the Atlantic Council is used by Facebook to determine what gets shut down by Facebook. So it's a direct connection between the Atlantic Council, the British government, the State Department, you know, etc. What gets shut down by Facebook is the, is, is run by the uh, uh, Atlantic Council. So that's your censorship. Now, Barbara uses QAnon as, a, as an example of cognitive infiltration, which targets Trump supporters. And so they did a massive targeting of Trump supporters with QAnon and to, to disrupt the supporters. And basically, it was totally off the wall. But it creates, it creates this paranoid environment where you don't know what's real, what's not. And you prey upon a population which is really not that um, knowledgeable. And, and this, this is the kind of technique that, that, that uh, they've developed. Now, part three will be coming out. Uh, I, I didn't get a chance to see it, but that was the part that deals with the overlap of all of these apparatus with the attempt to remove Trump. So that brings in Christopher Steele. That takes you back to the litman Echo affair in 2006, in which Christopher Steele was a key part of putting that together. And Christopher Steele's involvement with the FBI and the Justice Department going back to that period of time, which is over a decade, he knows all these people for over a decade, like Bruce Orr and, and so forth. And this whole network was way was already well uh, well um, uh, mobilized before even Trump got elected, well, long before the election. And they continued to be mobilized, and they're still mobilized, and they're still in, they're still there, they're still doing whatever. And so, uh, getting this report out in the coming several weeks will have a profound effect. It will have a profound effect because we're connecting the whole thing up and for the first time we can actually demonstrate what we have always known where the headquarters of, of directing all of these things was coming from. And without our movement, this whole thing would be in this piece, that piece, that little, you know, and, and it, you wouldn't have a clear picture of, of, of all of this. Now all this also applies to Canada because Canada's got one of these clusters in it too. I don't have a full detail uh, details on that, but I'm sure we're going to get at that. And, and they're running operations as well in Canada for their reasons, for the same reasons that they, they, they you know, we have a Canadian population that's not happy about everything, and uh, there's real issues emerging. So I, I, I didn't give a long presentation. I wanted just to give you a sense of that. So. Um, Our work in analysis, I, should, I want to mention two things. Our work in analysis is being taken very seriously in Russia and, and in China at the highest levels of leadership of those two countries. In Russia, we just had an article posted uh, by one of our activists, uh, Harley Schlanger, on the uh, Russian International Affairs Council. And the article was on how the, the developments in Syria and and Afghanistan with respect to troop withdrawals is an opening for settling these situ situations on around the idea of the Treaty of Westphalia and the advantage of the other. How do you how do you resolve these situations as you work out agreements that are in, to the advantage of everybody uh, there? But the fact that the fact that the Russian International Affairs Council posted this thing on their website is very significant because the National Affairs Council is everybody in Russia, the foreign ministry, the academics, the, the think tanks, the, the regional governments, the parliament, they all have, they all operate foreign policy and discussion of foreign policy through the Foreign Affairs Council. So that's important. And Helga uh, and, and, and the Schiller Institute, which she's a part, of, uh, their role in the Belt and Road was listed on the Belt and Road Encyclopedia. 
and so there is there is a sense there is a, there is a, a, a sense that we that what we say in our publications and what we say is being seriously looked at, and in that context, our ability to put this report together, which is it's a somewhat detailed report, I didn't go anywhere near. I didn't even touch the full the full extent of it. I couldn't do it tonight. But if you take the time to, to go to our website and read it, read it over, you know, re take your time to go through it, you, you will get not only the sense, but other people will begin to get the sense of what it, who it is that we're fighting, who, who, how is this being deployed? Because they're opening, they're openly, it's openly being exposed that there is a military quality information psychological cyber war, uh, cyber war being run. In a very integrated way throughout the world, through 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 networks that are act, that come out of the United Kingdom uh, as their base, but they also include a large part of the U.S. establishment, and that is so crucial. And I'm hoping that we, we, we do some serious damage over the next two weeks. On this, um, we need to. And beyond that, I'm going to leave it up for questions. Uh, don't want to take too long. So if you just raise your hand or take them out, they don't want to take questions on. Robbie. Can you go into this again with the US military cyber command and the connections to financial? I don't know. He just mentioned this in the in, in the report that there is this interface and that they're part of um, they're part of this whole situation. In other words, the banks and the, the cyber command, and I, I don't know. I need to. We need to know more. But my my sense is that if the financial system collapses, it's a national security issue, and therefore, and therefore, and therefore, and therefore, and therefore. Wait, can, okay, so maybe for the benefit of uh, maybe some of the new people here, just get into you know the role of the city of London and the connection to Wall Street. <laughs> um, why that plays an important part, the offshoring system. Okay. I think it's. A, I think it'd be important to go through that since we don't okay. have any markers. Okay. 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 Um, in the abstract and in our pamphlet, we go through the post-war period transformation of the world financial system, and that transformation was driven by the development of an offshore financial system that was centered on London. And ultimately, Wall Street comes in as well. Now, that offshore financial system is centered around, if, 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 you, read, if you watch the movie um, 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 Spider's Web, Britain's Second Empire, Spider's Web, uh, on YouTube, the, the way this was set up is the British allowed their their financial system to operate in dollars separate from from the pound, independent of. So there's an there was an unregulated dollar dollar system that developed around the, the secrecy jurisdictions uh, of the islands, Cayman Islands, you know, uh, you know, all these islands that became very very strong. And then the idea is that these islands would uh, would, would take deposits in dollars from from all over the world, from, especially from the U.S. initially, and all over the world, and that those deposits are, could be also, you could also set up trusts, huge trusts that, that you could use, and they would charge you for these trusts, but you could evade all, you could evade taxes and all of that. Tax and then, uh, the, uh, in the same period, you had the massive growth of the drug trade in, 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 in the United States and Europe, and this drug, the drug money is ultimately uh, would go into these offshore jurisdictions. So you built up this uh, this system, and then they lobby to re to uh, to uh, deregulate the U.S. banking system to make it uh, more possible to do this. And eventually, this thing just took over the world, essentially. But it took a long time, and that that system um, uh, is is based upon maintaining. A instability, because in instability, you can make a profit through financial speculation. So you don't want 
any part of the world that you uh, to be stable, and you don't want any part of the world to be investing in, in real economy, because because that takes the funds out of that system into into the into the real economy. They want to maintain. They want the, the directionality of the funds of being created by nations to go outside the country or go into this offshore jurisdiction, and then they want to speculate with that. And that's a control mechanism because because the current uh, because what happens is that every country that's involved, every country has to go through the system to do, get their oil. They have to go through the system to trade, to trade. But the problem is. They have to get a hold of these dollars, and, and their own currencies uh, can be speculated on. And so, what all the central banks of these countries have to do is constantly pump, uh, pump uh, to defend their currencies. So they're bleeding all the time uh, into the offshore system to defend their currencies against the speculators. And so, this is the system. That's why countries like China initially built up these huge foreign currency reserves, and also Japan and other nations. Because if they have a, a large dollar reserve, they have the ability to defend uh, their currencies. The Russians ended up doing the same thing. And the problem is they can't use those funds for investment because they have to have them there to defend their currencies. And on and on we go. And, then, and, and, and this system just has been growing. And then they introduced derivatives, and London became the center of derivative speculation. And it just goes, it, go, it goes more and more. So now the whole world is integrated into the system. All the central banks have the banks on, are integrated with the, the major banks who are on the central life support system where the central banks purchase, uh, central banks discount toxic financial assets to keep the banking system alive and so on and so forth. And that whole system uh, is causing tremendous uh, uh, lack of investment in the real economy. So Trump says $7 trillion uh, in, in, in the Middle East and Iraq for the war, but we can't put any of that in, in the real economy in the U.S. Why is that? Because the $7 trillion that went into, into Iraq was important to create the chaos, which was necessary for the system, because otherwise the, uh, that place would have been developed. That they would have had, uh, you know, Saddam Hussein, he was an asshole, but yeah, he was. A, he wanted to develop Iraq. You know, all these people wanted to develop, and they would have. They would have deployed their 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 internal currency and their oil revenues to develop. Yeah, Iran has been trying to use their oil revenue to develop, and they're under sanctions. You know, and on and on we go. Saudi Arabia is not really has not really been interested in development because that's that's their. That's the, the royal family and the Bedouin mentality and all of that. We don't want, I don't want to go there. But the point I'm saying is that that, that that instability is absolutely required for the system. And that instability is being threatened by the, by the rail lines that are, being, going to be, that are being built by China that are connecting all these parts of the world and bringing the potential for development. And the fact that Syria did not go under is huge, and, and it's a huge threat. And so when when Trump says he, he plans to remove troops and he started to remove the uh, remove the troops, then he's saying we're not going with that system anymore. And if he's not going to go with that system anymore, then there's no way to stop China and Russia and and, and a return uh, uh, and these countries from becoming developed because that's what's that's what's happening now. And then what, what that means for the dollar? That means the dollar, uh, the dollar, the dollars even ha either have to be used for, for, for the real economy or they're worthless. And what is China doing with its worthless dollars? They're investing in the real economy. What does Russia want to do with their dollars? They want to invest them in the real economy, but they're also moving out of the dollar for trade, uh, as as they can, and. This, the dollar system that the world is in is not a U.S. dollar system. It is a global offshore dollar system. If, if this offshore dollar system were to end, you still have a U.S. dollar. You still have a Canadian dollar that can be deployed by the Bank of Canada or can be deployed by the, uh, something equivalent created in the United States. You'd be perfectly fine. And the idea that we have is that 
you have a, a meeting of, of the four major nations, uh, Russia, China, and India, uh, the US, and you can bring Japan in, and we just say, okay, we're going to have a fixed exchange system, we're going to have clearing houses, and when the only time you have international trade in dollars, or yen, or, or, or rubles, or pounds, or, 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 or rupees, is when we do trade. You don't need to have all these dollars out there speculating on everything under the sun. Less than 1% of all the currency transactions are for trade. The rest is pure speculation. Is Why do you need it? Is everyone aware of that? All the money that's in this in the speculating offshore banking, or yeah. only 1% is actually dealt with in real economy. All the rest is speculation. So one last point is, if you're doing, if, if your currency exchanges are for trade, as they were before the takedown of the Bretton Woods system, when it was 75% was for trade, then what the hell do you need with a global currency? You don't need a global currency. You have every, everybody's national currency is being used by the nation and is being exchanged when you do trade. And you have clearinghouses, and you have agreements between nations on what they need to purchase and what they need from each other, and so on and so forth. And that's the system we have to go to, and that's the system we will go to if we don't have a nuclear war. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I got a little, I got a little on hinge there. That's <laughs> good. Um, Mike, you're up next, and then Stu. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to be more extreme than Paul here, and I was thinking of, of what uh, uh, Phil was saying about, about uh, oil pipelines and export of Canadian oil being blocked. Um, uh, by the various issues in BC and so on, First Nations and the uh, world. And, I, and I, it, it occurred to me when a good solution it would be simply to, for Alberta to put an oil pipeline north under the Arctic Ocean and sell the oil to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> good idea. <laughs> They've already got it. Well, they got lots there too. That's yeah, right. they do, but they import oil from yeah. Iran, I think, and then reach Well, they, they can yeah. transfer it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe that'll go into our second edition. I don't expect you to have a response to that. Well, I do. <laughs> I do. Um, I'd like to go yeah. back. Or, or the Alaska land bridge. But they, they could do an energy pipeline east to the head, head to the Great Lakes head, uh, and right there, and then transfer it to the rest of Canada. I mean, they're, they're trying to go all the way down through the Sarnia, through southwestern Ontario, when in fact they could go to the, the where the Great Lakes end, and, and, yeah, and oh, yeah, tie yeah, it in yeah. right there. Yeah, and Thunder Bay. Yeah, yeah. They would be, they'd be in business. The only problem is that the Great Bay shipping uh, stops during the winter. Well, it hasn't for a while now, but it can be stopped, yes. Yeah, I mean, they need ice cream. Anyway, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're up next. No, Paul was going to respond. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Paul was okay. going <clears throat> the, the fear, I believe, that the cluster that, I'm, that we need to find out is operating in Canada has, or what the what the what they have the fear about their colony, uh, Canada, which is not quite a colony, but is, and this is a fear that they always have is 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 economic integration of Canada uh, and the the development of a, of a of an integrated economy also means a more a, a real nation, a more powerful nation. And the revenues that could be obtained um, from the export to uh, of these capabilities on a global scale, rather than just to the U.S., um, would of course increase uh, the the, um, the the the, the uh, capability of, of of Canadian development. And um, while it's one thing to have Canada be a, an industrial uh, component to the to the North American or to the U.S. industrial component. It's another thing to have a, a Canada which is independent, you know, of uh, independent and acting on it uh, as a, as a nation in, um, in terms of that, uh, in terms of the interests of its people. And, and so this is this is a different thing. And of course, if, can, if Canada was acting that way, then they would have a better deal with the U.S. And they wouldn't be so um, pushed around by the U.S. on behalf of this empire. So, thank you. Uh, I think. Did you have one, Stu? Or did you? Uh, yeah, it's more of a comment. 
can you make it quicker? Yeah, so uh, that thing about uh, Hitler wouldn't have been necessary if you could have got the working class to accept austerity. So the question is, how do you get them to accept austerity? You do. What you do is you make them hate themselves. Right? All you right. Make, you make them guilty <laughs> of destroying all these, all these nice birds and fish and make them guilty of destroying the planet. That's the green agenda. That's, the, that's what it's there to do is to get people to accept shit, eat shit and like it. And so what the green agenda does is to, is to make everybody feel guilty that they're destroying the planet, to hate their own species. That's really what it's about. Because in reality, the warming and the cooling that goes on is completely out of our control. Uh, and uh, what we're actually facing is something far more serious, and that's a renewed a renew, freeze up. A new, a new ice age. Either in my, many ice ages were lucky, or the big kahuna. Not. We don't know. But the bulk of our last half million years have been in an ice age. Okay, so I'm going to cut off there. And Jason, you're up next. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to ask uh, <clears throat> like, uh, what you thought of the uh, 2008 uh, financial mess. Right. Would that uh, be repeated again? Uh, Okay, yes, but it's different because after 2008, there was a meeting of the Group of 20 in London in 2009, and they mobilized to have every nation uh, set up a method to try to prevent it from happening, which involved uh, keeping systemically important financial institutions solid. Now, systemically important financial institutions are the big ones, the big 20, you know, big 15, 20 banks in the world. They're called systemically important financial institutions because if they go under, they collapse everything. So that's why they're called systemically important. So they're not trying to hide the fact that there's a problem. But the way they attempted to solve the problem is everything must be done and, and, and all the banking laws and that all the major, all these countries have to be changed to keep these, to 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 deal with cross-border crises, to deal with keeping these financially significant institutions in place uh, from collapsing. And so, uh, the Dodd Frank bill has what's called the bail-in provisions, and C15 in Canada has a bail-in provision in all the European countries, and they set up a, a an entity to add to the IMF, World Bank, and the World Trade Organization called the Financial Stability Board, which oversees all of this. And we had a situation in Italy where a major bank in Genoa went under, or was going under, and the European uh, Union demanded that they, they bail in the bank, that is, they, they take the depositors' money and to give them some worthless stock. But the Italian government intervened and said no, and they, they, they are, they're refusing to do that. They're, re, they're recapitalizing the bank. Ultimately, they're going to put it under government control and preventing, preventing this uh, from occurring. There's a huge fight around this, but that's not the big bank. But that's, that's just an, a skirmish. The point is, is that everything is being done to keep, these, uh, keep this from happening. So if it were to happen, you wouldn't be able to bail it out like you did the last time because it's on a much bigger scale, because it's, it, and so forth. The, um, so yeah, we, and, 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 and I'm not just saying this, this is an IMF, people are saying this, the former Federal Reserve Chairman Yellen is saying this, and the big debt, the, one of the bigger debtor, debt crises is, 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 is corporate debt, or the sale of corporate bonds, which have gone on. A huge sale of corporate bonds, but the interest rates were low. And then the, a lot of the corporate debt was then used to, uh, to buy stocks, to keep the stocks artificially up, which in turn kept the values up of the whole system, and so on and so forth. So you're dealing with that kind of problem. And then this corporate, then, then um, when they started raising the interest rates, it threatened the whole system. So they're in that kind of, they're in that kind of situation. At any moment, this could happen. And all, Ultimately, ultimately, um, 
you're going to have to shut all that down. You're going to have to reinstate. Um, you're going to have to build a firewall between this offshore system and which is the investment banking side and the commercial part of your country's banking system. And the country's going to have to do that. There's no other way to do it. And then they have to find a way to, to finance the things in the country that are keep people employed and keep, the, and keep everything going. Otherwise, everything collapses. When everything collapses, you either you either you do something like Franklin Delano Roosevelt did. Are you familiar with the situation with Franklin Delano Roosevelt? Yeah. Is anybody is everybody familiar with what happened? When when as Roosevelt was being inaugurated, the US, the US banking system had collapsed. Yeah. And what he did is he went to the people and he said, We're gonna we're gonna deal with this. And he, he instituted um, a bank a bank uh, holiday. And they said, and they reorganized the banking system. And then they came out, and they insured uh, deposits up to a certain part, but they would not allow any more the investment banks from having control over the deposits. And the deposits were regulated for commercial activity only. Ultimately, that's what he, that's what he ended up doing. And that saved the banking system. The banking system that the people use. Otherwise known as glass steagle. Otherwise known as glass steagle. That ended up being the law. And that and that kept things from going in this direction. So yes, it, it is coming. It will come. The question is where where does the government, where does the people stand? Where do the people and their government stand in relationship to this? Will you have a a an executive will the executive act for the people? And if they do, it'll be bank separation, it'll be glass steagle all over again, it'll be whatever. <coughs> right now you have a government in Italy that's saying they'll do that. They're saying they will do it. And we have a president who I suspect would do it in the US. I don't know, I don't know if we have a prime minister in Canada who, who would do something like that. But Canada would be easy. <coughs> you have the Bank of Canada right there. Still still there, yeah. Yeah, uh, there's that uh, issue of uh, what, uh, money laundering through casinos here in the lower Bay. And real estate. Yeah, real estate. Yeah. That's kind of like that. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's going to be law too. People are always going to find a way to launder their money. <laughs> Don't ever live in some world you think that's ever going to stop. Because that's never going to stop. Well, it's it's gonna well, well things have changed a lot there. What the games? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I have a friend, a close friend that works there. And yeah, you just can't go open up an account anymore like you used to be able to. They become respectable. <laughs> well, I wouldn't go as far as to say that. I, I wouldn't even go as far as to say that respectability even is involved in this spirit in any way. Okay, I'm going to stop you guys there. I think Robbie had a question. Or something Yeah, I want to say. We'll be bench A couple of things here. Pay attention here, guys. Yes. So, if you can, take the time to watch um, um, Spider's Web documentary on YouTube. It's excellent. It's Just over an hour. And it, it goes through this whole process, the history of it, and where it stands today. Um, and there is, they go through it here through uh, um, a couple of guys who worked in the system, um, but today where it stands is fifty trillion dollars, right? Fifty trillion. All of which that money was made in the real economy, in the physical economy. Sorry, not all of it, but the, the base amount of it. And then once that money is siphoned off, so this profits from corporations. And today the predominant industry which um, kind of controls all of the other, uh, the, the other, the major parts of the economy in the West is, is this military, right? Industrial military complex. Military industrial complex backed up by, um, by and, and they, they have this supportive role, right? The financial system with the military. Um, so, so you really, you have to, I don't know, I mean that, that process alone, once you watch this documentary, you understand what's at stake, and you understand why they don't want this to be exposed. And if you 
if you see, I get the sense that the Yellow Vest Movement in France, and now because of the work of, of serious activists like us and others who are having the dialogues with the Yellow Vest here in Canada, is getting them to understand this as well. And so what I'm doing is I'm bringing up bank separation. This is one of the demands of the France Yellow Vest, which tells me, as Phil was saying earlier, that they are serious and that they're informed. If you understand the threat that bank separation has to this system right here, you'll understand that it ends the war economy. It's not the only step, but it is the very most important first step. And I'm sorry to be shameless here, I'm plugging our book by the way. But this process that Paul's been going through, this um, the history um, and the, the plan that uh, LPAC has in the United States, the people in the Italian government right now who have been uh, connected to this movement for 40 years, a couple of them, um, they are pushing this as well. And it's in direct opposition to Brussels, it's in direct opposition to uh, the fascist, fascism of the EU, the dictates, right? So, so this is the plan for Canada, where you start, you start at step number one, firewall, bank separation. So that's, that's our first step. Then you have to go to national banking, which means reinstituting the functions that there's no legal, uh, from our research, there's no legal um, changes that impediments to actually using the Bank of Canada for the physical economy. All that needs to be done is uh, the um, Minister of Finance needs to direct the uh, uh, bank governor, I believe, is that how it goes, to start um, having the Bank of Canada distribute credit to provinces and municipalities. At zero percent. At zero percent. Zero percent with low zero. interest, yeah. right? It, it can, yeah, yeah. yeah just to, to automatically cover. zero percent because the government owns the bank, so anything they make goes back. It to goes back oh, oh, into. Oh, Clear something up for me here. Yeah. Did you say the government owns the bank of yeah. Canada? It was fully nationalized in 1938. They still do. They choose not to use it. They choose West. not to use it. Is the Bank of Canada yeah. not mostly privately funded and owned no, and run? No, that was 35, but it was fully nationalized in 1938. But weren't there changes after that? Yeah. Weren't there changes after that? Sorry. After that, you say it wasn't there changes. Wasn't there changes to it after the that? The major change that took place after that happened in 1961 in the fight between James Coyne and Stephen Baker and the, and the finance minister. What they did then was to put in section 14, subsection 2 of the Act, the Bank of Canada Act. You can get it on the web. It's, you look it's it down there, it's and it says very clearly okay. that if there's a disagreement between the Minister of Finance and the government, the Minister of Finance after consultation with the cabinet, all that shit, will make his demand the requirements known to the governor in writing for a specific time and specific purposes, and the bank shall comply. It's section 14 of the act. And does that, does that happen? Uh, does that normally happen? No, because the politicians, of course, uh, basically do whatever the BIA has done for the right. right. And banks. Right, and so there's an, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I, it's so legal. It's yeah, legally there's a, there's an Italian lawyer that's been suing the, the Bank of Canada over a lot of this. Okay, guys, I just have to stop you there. Sorry, if you got a question? That, that's a whole. Yeah, it's another whole. No, I'm sorry. That's it's another a, long discussion in itself. I, I'm sure that it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I apologize. Well, it, it's a worthy. But uh, Mike's Mike's up next with his question. Um, I have a preliminary question because I'm naive on sure. this stuff. A preliminary question. Is, my main question will work and play at the end of this. Uh, all this money that is in offshore banks, and I've heard Phil mention vast amount of money there. Um, is that money, in fact, all in U.S. dollars, or is it in a, a, a bouquet of various currencies? I'm not sure, but I think it, most of it, mostly, if not all, most of it is in is denominated in dollars. U.S. dollars, just to get yeah. currency. Yeah. So I was thinking that uh, perhaps some of the world uh, financial changes that might have to be made down the road is simply for, now I, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Paul, but 
uh, for uh, the United States to do what I think was done in Mexico uh, decades ago, a couple of decades ago, whereby the existing currency of that time was called in and new currency was issued at 1%, or, yeah, one, one tenth of the value of the old currency or something like that. That was France. No, no, Mexico. 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 I'll let Paul correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, that would simply dry up all of the money in the offshore banks overnight. Okay. Well, if, if it's devalued. Uh, there, yeah, there would be a devaluation of this. The, 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 that happened in Mexico. The, the, the deeper issue is the issue of a monetary system versus a credit system. A monetary system versus a credit system. There, there are all kinds of plans to create a basket of currencies of uh, uh, monetary unit, to use an IMF monetary unit, uh, uh, government called special drawing. Right? Special drawing. There's another one. Yeah, there's another one that they talk about. The there was one proposed by um, Keynes before the Grand Woods, uh, Unicor. Um, all monetary systems are based on the idea that you create a monetary system and then uh, everything is measured by the money that you create. And, um, and so you use that monetary system to do trade, to do, to do exchange. And the credit system is different. The credit system is based upon the idea that you don't have a monetary system. You have a currency that is used for a specific purpose. The money is the means of doing something, not, not acquiring it the basis of doing something. Money is merely the means, and when you use money as a means, it's a different than, than having this uh, monetary system. And Hamilton understood this very well, and so did FDR. FDR studied Hamilton, Franklin Delano Roosevelt studied Hamilton. So this is very important. If, uh, if you do the Bretton Woods system, all those offshore dollars would either find a, a way to invested in the real economy or they would disappear, they would, they would cease to exist. But the, you, you don't want to substitute one monetary system for another. And that's what, that's what uh, uh, originally the idea of the basket of currencies of uh, idea of bringing the, the original, believe it or not, the original idea of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, that was originated by an, an international banker, forgot his name, who worked for Goldman Sachs or one of these banks, was to get all their currencies to come together and peg them into one, and then have a, have a European currency, and then have a dollar currency, and then kind of have this basket of currencies, and then they sold it. They tried to sell it to the Russians and the Indians and the, and the Chinese as a basket of currency system, and this will make Europe, this will give you power just like we have power with the dollar and the euro and all of that. It didn't get bought, okay? <laughs> but but the idea is then you could you could play the dollar against the euro against the basket of currencies and so on and so forth. But that that you don't need that, and you never did. You never needed to have that uh, uh, because because credit is issued by sovereign nation for the purpose of and it's it's um, and the the key. The thing about credit is that you can use it to pay for pay taxes in, in the nation. So it's, it's it's good because you can pay you can use it to pay your taxes, right? And that's how that's how it works. And so the peop so the people are basically the population is basically um, it's based on the population, but it's it's based upon uh, the sovereignty of the people, not based upon the nation having to subordinate itself to a monetary system. Rather, you have a credit system internally, which is subordinated.